Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Always a pleasure to uh, be learning uh, together uh, here at Drisha. Uh, this, is, uh, this class is part of our uh, Falls Man uh, discussion on the parasha this week with uh, Mr. Michael Bernstein. I hope I'm saying, yeah, Bernstein. And um, uh, just another reminder that I'll send an invitation to become a panelist uh, that would uh, allow you to unmute if you'd like to participate uh, in class. Um, it would give you the option to uh, keep your video, uh, turn your video on or keep it off. Um, if you do uh, become a panelist, just a reminder to stay muted when you're not actively speaking so we don't have background noise and then you can uh, feel free to uh, unmute whenever you would like to speak. Um, you can also engage in writing uh, here in the chat on Zoom or as a comment if you're watching us live on Facebook. Um, uh, Michael Bernstein is a Drisha lead uh, ad administrator. His scholarly work has focused on Karait law codes, uh, but his chief interest is uh, Peshat-based biblical interpretation. And with that, I'll turn this to you, Michael. Great. Hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are. Um, this week, I wanted to zoom in real close on just one episode from the Parsha. Uh, so this is Parshat Ve'yishlach, which the entire first section of deals with Yaakov, uh, beginning to approach a reunion with Esav uh, and the preparations he makes and what happens to him before and during that uh, encounter with Esav and the people who are accompanying Esav. So um, we'll, we'll touch on the actual opening and the setting of the stage for the uh, first section of the parasha a little bit later when I go to a book that I'm going to read excerpts from. I won't read, uh, I won't just stand here reading full text out of the book, although it might look that way. Um, but the first thing I wanted to do was uh, look at the Mepharshim on the page of the traditional Das Mikra. I'm sorry, not Das Mikra, I mean, completely misspoke of the traditional uh, Mikros Gedolos uh, on the episode of Yaakov wrestling or grappling with the Ish. So the Pasuk uh, in Paraklam and Bet says, that uh, this is after he had already taken everyone to the other side of the river. Suddenly we find in Pasa uh he, he has already brought everything across. Suddenly we're told, actually, he stayed behind by himself. Uh, a man, using the term ish, uh, grappled with him, or we're going to see interpretations of Aleph Beit Kuf in just a moment, until the, the break of day. And then the story goes on from there, and we'll touch on that. But uh, just that, that was a freehand translation. I'll tell you how Robert Alter translates the line, because he also tries to keep it pretty simple. Um, he, it says, he was left alone, and a man wrestled with him, which is about as not taking a side as you can, because um, as many of you probably already know, there's uh, a, the Midrash that in whatever respect, this was not a human being. Either this was an angel or a specific angel or an angel that represents Asaph. We'll see these views inside in a minute. Um, Robert Alter makes the note that the reason it's, that this is from a literary standpoint that we use the term ish here is because we're we're looking from Yaakov's point of view. He's alone, and from his perspective, suddenly a man is attacking him. Um, okay, so that's a, it seems like a straightforward translation, but as with many translations, the actual meaning of what's going on in the story is not all that clear on the surface of the story. Um, so let's take a look, and uh, and, on, and I'll give you background to where I'm coming from. When I look at the Mepharshim on the page of the traditional Mikraut Kudolot, normally I expect to see some drash, some of what Rashi calls um, Midrash Hamiyashev Divrei HaMikra, some drash that he was closer to like a literary interpretation rather than fanciful uh, fan fiction style uh, Midrash that sometimes gets it, makes its way into the Mepharshim. And I expect to see Pashtanim, and sometimes I expect to see language discussions. But what I didn't see here was anyone saying this was really just a human being. And that's because of this, in comparison with other instances 
where you find an angel described as Ish, or you find something described as Ish that is clearly not a normal flesh and blood human being, um, you don't always get a discussion of the sort that follows here, where the the other participant in the discussion won't tell him tell Yaakov their name, and he gives him a new name and a blessing. This is something that is is a an act of divinity of being at a higher level than the human that you are interacting with. So the word ish is strange. Um, Vaya Vake is not entirely clear. It's not entirely clear how Yaakov ends up alone back on the other side of the river, because at the very the ending of the very previous verse, it says he, it doesn't say he sent them across the river. It says he brought them. This is why the Midrash cited by Rashi, and we'll see it uh, with a couple others as well, says he must have had some little belongings to go back for. But it, this is, that's more of a, uh, a decision on the part of Chazal to fill in a blank that they also had a question about than it is something that is suggested by the, there's nothing in the text that suggests he forgot something other than the question of what was he doing back there. Okay, so let's take a look at Rashi uh, and some other Mepharshim in the first part of this discussion. And we're gonna find that this interacts with uh, Perushim on uh, a, an episode in Parak Lamed Zayin where Yosef also encounters an Ish and how the interpretations here differ from there. So we'll we'll go in no particular order. I'll just, uh, I, the order that I have them laid out here on the sheet is not chronological, it's not geographical. Um, first, we have Rashi, um, who makes the note that Shachach Pach and Tan and Chazar and Yaakov went back to get some small vessels. Then he quotes Menachem Ibn Saruk, the uh, grammarian who interpreted Valle Aveik, as Vayis Apar, he became covered in dust from the word Avak, um, the, the dust of the road. Shahayu Ma'alim Afar Barag Lehem Al Yedei Na'anuam. They were kicking up dust by their uh, thrashing around. Vili Nere, says Rashi, it more appears to him, Shahu Lashon Vayis Kasher, more like they were entangled. They were. Um, uh, they they were locked up together in a, in this wrestling match. He quotes a couple of examples, um, and he explains that this is related to an Aramaic word, basar da avikube, the avik le mevak. He has evidence that this could be what this root is, so he disagrees with Menachem's interpretation. He says it doesn't mean that they were kicking up dust; it means that they were uh, intertangled. Uh, this is the way of two people when they are exerting themselves with great strength to try to knock one another over. Uh, you grab a hold like a Greco-Roman, you know, bear hug, and you ovco you in you know Aleph base kuf not to get dusty, but to get intertangled with the limbs of the other person. And at the end, as an afterthought, Rashi adds, The Chazal in the Midrash explained that this mysterious figure, this Ish, because the entire comment has been about Aleph Beis Kuf. He hasn't even mentioned the man. As an afterthought, he says, by the way, this man was the, the patron spirit of Esav, whatever that means within the context of Chazal cosmology. Um, Next, let's take a look at Ramban, who says, Yaakov remained behind, he quotes Rashi about leaving small belongings behind, and he says um, that rather we will read Vaya'avi Reim, indeed, in the previous verse, we won't read it as he brought them over, but indeed we would read it as he sent them over. So he chooses to read that one word a little bit differently and avoid the problem of why would he have to go back. He moves on, and for... I don't know, it would take me uh, two and a half minutes to read you all of the discussion he has discussing Aleph Bez Kuf, because he really gets into these examples of Rashi and uh, the ones that come from Aramaic. He tries to make Avuka, the word for a, a, a bonfire, uh, come into the relations because of the, the intertangling of those uh, wicks or, or pieces of kindling. Um, then he starts explaining about in guttural interchanges and in grammar between Chet and Aleph, and he goes on and on and on and on, and we're even on the next page. 
we're not just on the next page. We're in the next pasuk where it says, Vayar ki lo yaholo, and, and one party saw that he could not overcome the other. Yahol is also an interesting word to try to translate, but it refers to the, the ish saw, ki lo yahol le Yaakov. And that's where Ramban says, Malachav uh, gibore koach oseid varav, which is a quote of a, uh, a pasuk from Tehillim, Valkain lo yahol lo hamalach lahaziko. And so the angel or the spirit could not harm him. He says it, offhandedly in the next Pasuk after the where the Ish is introduced. So he also is taking it kind of as a given. Yeah, this was not a, a human being. So, so far, no Pashtanim who, who I was looking for, I was digging to try to find someone say to me that this is a human being and what is this thing going on, this mysterious guy who's grappling with him? Because I thought there must be some Pashtan out there. If you look at Sadia Gaon, um, he makes a very brief, comment and the comment is uh subject has fallen victim to some uh manuscript difficulties and in the text of the Torah Chaim here the the you have you have two words in the comment of Sadia Gaon and then a one two three four five and a half line note explaining the two word comment and the problems in the manuscripts but more or less he's saying this is a mala um so he also is saying that this is a, a very clearly Ish in quotation marks, right? Um, Rashbam straight up inserts the word Malach into the Pasuk. He, he's writing along as if he's giving you a running commentary, which he is, and he says, The angel shows up. Why does he grab him and grapple with him initially? so that he won't be able to run away. If you think in your head, Yaakov's by himself and he just sent everyone ahead, maybe you think the reason he's by himself on the back of the other side of the river is that he's started to retreat, he's running away. So Rashbam says that this angel takes hold of him so that he won't be able to run away. Rather, he will be forced to remain and see the fulfillment of the promise that, that Hashem made to him that Esav wouldn't bring him to any harm. Chizkuni um, does something Chizkuni does a lot, which is quotes Rashbam verbatim without citing him. Okay, he's also on the page. Um, Sfarno, the, you can, this is how you tell I'm not going in no particular order because I went from, you know, Ramban to Chizkuni to Sfarno. Um, the Sfarno says, Vayavik ish imo zahaya po al malach b'mitzvah sboro b'li safek. So we haven't seen anyone who says this was anything other than an angel, but Svarno very defensively says, without a doubt, this must be the, the, the work of one of God's malachs um, in the same way. And, and in a couple of these places, the Torah's time commentary is bringing a pasuk that only Ramban actually brings, I I'm sorry, not Ramban, uh, that may be why may, no, none of them may actually bring it. The the pasuk v'ha'ish Gavriel, um, where clearly we're talking about the malach Gavriel, but the word ish is used matter of factly as a matter of course. Um, so he says belisa fake without any possible doubt. This ish grappling with Yaakov is the work of a malach at the command of Yaakov's creator. Um, all right, now, before we go back and take a look at Ibn Ezra and Radak, because those are going to be big for us, um, let's skip ahead in the Chizkuni to where we see in the following Pasuk, um, Vayar kilo yacholo vayigabachaf yorecho, this Ish sees that he cannot overcome Yaakov or is stalemated with Yaakov. And so he touches or injures the, the um, plane of the thigh. The something or other, the sinew or the muscle uh, is displaced at the hip and Yaakov, uh, when, when they are grappling. So on that portion, when, when we are discussing Kaf Yarech Yaakov, his kuni adds, even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu had promised him, just like he quoted from the Rashbam. Even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised him, I'll protect you from everything. 
Nonetheless, the Malach still injured him. It was a punishment, a penalty. God sent the Malach to injure Yaakov as a punishment for this apparent fear or retreat from Esav. Um, as it says in Pasuk Ches earlier, that Yaakov was afraid. Um, and this is the same thing that we see with Moshe in the Malon, even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Ki imach, the Malach uh, attacks him uh, in that strange incident in the, the, the way station with uh, Tsipora and the uh, uh, saving Moshe's life. And the Chizkuni says that's because he was similarly being punished because he was afraid of Paro in his heart. So it's interesting that so Chizkuni takes what Rashbam has said about the Malach forcing him to stay in the first place to make him see Akarish Baruch Hu's promise come true. And that's also why he was allowed to break the promise seemingly uh, because Yaakov had been afraid in the first place. It's kind of a strange uh, um, way of closing that loop. Um, so Can, may I yeah. interrupt for a minute? Hi, I'm sorry. Um, um, I think when you were back in the Ramban and you said there was a whole long discourse, and one of the things I think you quickly said is that something about switching the Aleph and the Chet. Sure. Is I, am I right about that? So if that's correct, then first of all, Lachabok is to hug, and that would also, you describe the gladiator thing as a bear hug, but it, in, in a way, it also is a premonition for me or a foreshadowing of when he actually does Meet Esav, and it says Vayaratz Esav Likratzo Vayechab Kehu. So absolutely, the, you know absolutely. that that hug is can be both a negative and a positive. Yeah, and I he and he actually says Ve'efshar she he Vaye Avek Vaye Chabek Kemo Vayechab Kehu. Oh, okay. So I wasn't so seeing he it. Actually, that, he, mm -hmm. you, no, you nailed it. Just uh, outside mm -hmm. the page, because that's exactly mm -hmm. where he's trying to lead. On, on, as he's going along discussing the gram rubber. But yeah, that would be the literary uh, echo that was uh, that was being foreshadowed. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I so, was also, yeah. if you don't mind, what, I, I was also just thinking about, I know that the, the kaf yerech is meant to, to be the phi, but to me, a kaf is a heel, and it's kind of like Yaakov. Yaakov grabbed Esau's heel when he was born, and now Esau's that, malach is I, grabbing Yaakov's kaf. But the word for heel is is the word for Yaakov's name. Ayin kuf bet is the word for yes, heel. Yes, no, Kaf I know would that. Be like the sole of the of the foot. Right. Okay. But in in modern Hebrew, isn't it, um, a cave more like the ankle and kaf is the heel? I'm just curious. All right. Uh, the the jumping around is a function of the fact that we are we're we're really picking and choosing here between all of these interpretations that what they have in common is that none of them are, are saying this is just a person that's grappling with him. They are all taken as a given in one way or another, with one background or another, with one explanation of the extenuating circumstances or another. They are all saying either Sar Shel Esav, Ma'aste Malach, or just saying outright the Rashbam says it was a Malach. So Excuse there's... Me. Yes. Excuse me, I joined late, so maybe you said this, I apologize. But I remember once learning <clears throat> that if we look back to the last time that the word Ish came up in the Parsha, it is describing Yaakov and his wealth. So that when Vaye Avek Ishimo, that Yaakov was really fighting with himself. So that's the second half of today's lecture, because I have a <laughs> Another book down here by Rabbi Shmuel Klitzner, who goes into, there's a whole two or three power, I'm sorry, two or three chapters <laughs> where he's unpacking that whole idea that it's the duality of Yaakov. And that's where we're really headed. So this is why we're sort of uh, jumping around in the primary sources. But I'm sorry. The closest we get, the closest we get um, uh, to finding someone who we might expect to say this was just a human being who attacked Yaakov and ended up in a stalemate of a wrestling match with him. Um, we get to, uh, we would look at, I would always be looking at Radak and Ibn Ezra. Um, both Radak and Ibn Ezra take as a given here that this is a supernatural being. Let's take a look. First, we have Radak, Ampasa Chafe, Vaye Avek Ishimo, Nis Avakimo, Ad Avak. He just gives the explanation of 
Menachem that Rashi quoted, that they were kicking up dust. Ish Malach, straight into the point. This man was an angel. Uh, in the in the scene where Yehoshua, near the beginning of Sefer Yehoshua, encounters the angel uh, of Hashem, he at first doesn't know that it's an angel of Hashem, and the word that's used from again from his perspective is Ish. Um, and then uh, here we go. He's the one who quotes Viha Ish Gavriel in in Sefer Daniel. You have the Malach Gavriel clearly referred to with the word Ish, as if there's no big deal about using that word for that entity. Uh, he goes on to say why angels might be called Ish, and he gets he he goes off on a sidetrack on that for a while. In the next verse, uh, where the Ish cannot overcome Yaakov. Um, he gives an interpretation that um, is interesting in light of what Chizkuni had to say. He says, Ramaz lo she'esav lo yuchalo, aval hu yichad mitzad acher, mitzad yurecho, Ramaz lo bezesh yichav mi echad mi yotza eirecho, v'hi bito shenisbala laknani. That was a lot. I'll go slow. Um, by dislocating his hip or injuring his thigh, um, this was a divine hint to Yaakov that Esav will not be able to overcome him, but he will be pained by another side because Selah, the word for, for um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, he, he, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Forget that I said that. Um, he will be hurt from another side, uh, on the side of his Yarech which is a euphemism for the general lap area in the sense of Yotze'e Yerech, offspring, that he will be harmed, Yich'ad, Yich'av Mitzad Bito. His daughter will be sexually assaulted by the Canaanite man. And so this hint, by hurting his hip, it's a hip to it's a hint to him about some way that he will Asa will not be able to overcome you, but you will be injured in your family, and they, somehow the Yarech was uh, a hint to that, which is another interesting. It, it seems like these th there is a thread in the parshanut of this episode that seems to want to explain why Yaakov had to be injured. What does this injury mean? Because God has just promised that Yaakov will not be brought to any harm. And then Radak adds, as an afterthought, Right? He wakes up the next morning, um, and it says that he's tzolea, tzadi lamed ayin, he's limping. Radak says, it is possible that this entire episode was a prophetic vision in a dream, even though he woke up limping. In other words, we finally have someone not saying that this was a real man, but, but not insisting that it was a supernatural being, because Radak has brought up the possibility here that this never actually happened. This was all some sort of vision that that he underwent and woke up limping physically as a result of that vision um that's one of the that is basically as close as you'll get in the traditional mafarshim to anyone saying that this was not a mala per se and you remember that Adak began his comments by just saying ish malach so it's a secondary interpretation and he says efshar at the beginning of it um now, Ibn Ezra doesn't really even comment. Ibn Ezra is where I would normally also go for a shot type interpretation. And so I'm looking and I see Valle Avek and he gives the, the explanation about kicking up dust. And then he's already up to explaining what the phrase about daybreak means. He doesn't discuss the word ish at all. Instead, similar to Ramban, we're already in the next verse. And it says, Kilo yacholo, and he adds the word, who could not overcome him? Malach, this angel who we all just know is here. We all know that Ish means Malach. That's what he takes as an assumption. But what's interesting is that um, the um, 
another example that that we see of an ish referring to this kind of a mysterious encounter is in chapter 37 of Bracious, where Yaakov sends Yosef to go find his brothers, and he goes to Shrem, and they're not there, and so he's looking around for them, and it says, ish the man says, you look lost. What do you need? And he asks him for directions and he sends him along. And there is a Madrashic tradition, of course, that this is that this is uh, no ordinary man. So if we take a look at the Mepharshim there, uh, Rashi uh, uh, quotes the same pasuk that we saw in Radak from Daniel. It says, Vayim ehu ish. Rashi doesn't say this was an angel. He says this was Gavriel. ish ze Gavriel. ish Gavriel. Okay. Um, Ramban doesn't insist that this is an angel. Ramban puts it this way: Zimein lo hakadosh baruch hu more derech. Um, he phrases it as saying that God prepared someone to show him the way. And only after that does he cite and say, This is what Hazal are referring to, the Amram ki ha'ishim heim malachim, in saying that there is there's a class of ish in Tanakh that is a reference to malachim. But what I thought was interesting, um, before we move on to a modern take on this, what I thought was interesting is that Ibn Ezra, who we just saw at the end of our uh, list of Mepharshim on the page in our own Parsha, took it as a given that that was a Malach, right? This Ish is a Malach, just like this Ish, just like that Ish. It has to be something supernatural. On the page in uh, Perak Lamed Zion, where this man encounters Yosef and gives him directions, Ibn Ezra's comment is, Derech hapshat, echad meovre derech. According to the Pshat, this is just someone who was walking along the road. This is a human being, a regular ish. So it's very. it was interesting to me that um, you don't get anyone saying that kind of comment, right? It would have been very simple for we, for us to find an Ibn Ezra on our Pasuk that said, Dera Hapshat, you know, Listi Ba'alma, right? Like, according to the Pshat, this was just some sort of bandit. But it can't be that, because as you see in the continuation of the story here, they go to this stalemate at daybreak. The um, the assailant sees that he can't overcome Yaakov and instead does some sort of dirty trick to injure him. And Yaakov will not submit. He won't let go. At this point, the day is breaking and this entity, this assailant, demands to be released. That's not something that a normal assailant would do, right? Um, you know, we I, I have to go. It's daybreak. Um, and Yaakov, for whatever reason, demands a blessing. If someone was wrestling with you on a riverbank all night, it's kind of strange to demand a blessing. Um, and instead of doing it, he asks him his name. Um, and the the way that the story proceeds with him giving him the uh, the new name or the additional name of Yisrael is also not something that you would expect from someone who had just jumped you on a riverbank. So something is so clearly divinely influenced here that I think that is why the Mepharshim are so strong in there. There is no comment on the page that says this was just a man who was on the road. Like there is with the Ish in chapter 37 because yeah, of the because way that the story proceeds. There's only, there's only one way to take it. Well, the Ish in chapter 37 could, doesn't do anything except direct him. So anybody who happened to encounter the brothers could do that. But no one except a divine being can change Yaakov's name to Israel. I mean, it's, it doesn't Absolutely. surprise me at all that, that everybody is saying it was a Malach. I, I, I wouldn't say that I was surprised, but uh, I was... I mean, I'd be surprised the it. other way. How could they say that it was a, a real person if he's, you know, changing Yaakov's name? from And, and God does the same thing in, in a, a couple right. of chapters God later okay it, so maybe yes yeah. yeah, so maybe you could say okay then how could it have been god the first time why do you have to do it twice but uh, i don't know 
Just yeah, it's just it would it would really only be because of the fact that if it if, because of the use of the word ish, and because right. of the fact that it seems that Yaakov was able to wrestle to wrestle that the ish to a stalemate, which you might not be actually expect. Right. There is this sense of duality in Yaakov, which we're going to exam examine for a, a few moments here, because I'm going to present some thoughts by Rabbi Shmuel Klitzner. If you want to get the book itself, I recommend it. It's called Wrestling Jacob. Um, oh, that's not clear at all. Um, uh, and the subtitle is Deception, Identity, and Freudian Slips in Genesis. So this is a <laughs> largely literary shot-based approach with a little bit of modern drush thrown in. And he spends three or four chapters uh, across the the just this portion of Parshas Vayishlach from finding out, from, from sending the messengers to Esav to the point even before they actually encounter one another and embrace. Just that section, there's a lot that happens to Yaakov and a lot that we learn about Yaakov in retrospect. So I'm going to read a few of the, uh, a, a few, um, Actually, hold on a moment. Let me see if I get the book in front of me, but or it's not actually blocking the view. Okay. Um, so Yaakov had been coming down to Lavan and encountered like Vaif Gaba Makom, um, encountered Beit El. Here he's coming back. And uh, we also have the word Pei Gimel I, and he encounters this place, or he has some sort of an encounter at this place. He regards the site of his vision as an encampment of the Lord, Machane Elohim, and calls it Machanayim, which means two camps. This is a foreshadowing of the dramatic scene later in this chapter that ends by describing Jacob as having struggled with divinities, Elohim, and with men. It is also the first of several dualities invoked by Yaakov that speak of his situation as bifurcated. When the messengers return and tell Yaakov that Esav is approaching, Yaakov divides his people in half, creating the two camps. And he then turns to Hashem and describes his situation as having changed from the lonely traveler with only a staff to the man who has become two camps, Machanot. This, this pasuk is particularly striking, striking because it's not that he's saying that his family became in two camps or his entourage has been divided into two camps, but he phrases it, Hayiti machanot, I have become two camps. So this theme of bifurcation reaches its climax at the river where Yaakov seems, this is what, uh, um, I couldn't see the name earlier, but someone made reference to this. Yaakov seems to split himself into two in order to wrestle with himself, which would make this the first time we've had discussed someone who's actually saying that the ish here is an ish. It refers to Yaakov, which is already kind of wild in its own way, but at least the word ish is being used to mean a flesh and blood human, which is another, uh, this is just another way to go with trying to explain the rest of the story. So implying the concept of wrestling with self by saying, first, by Vater Yaakov Levado, Yaakov remained alone. There was nobody with him. And then the next, very next words are Vayavek Ish Imo, a man wrestled with him. So if you don't read those two verses as sequential, but simultaneous, because they are the same it's the same piece of the story. It's the same line on the page. He remained alone and a man wrestled with him. The only way for Jacob to be alone and wrestling with another would be if the other is the other half of Yaakov. This interpretation would also account for the answer of the mysterious wrestler to the request, tell me your name, where the stranger doesn't say, I can't. The stranger says, why indeed should you ask my name? Which you could interpret as reading as saying, you already know what my name is. Um, there's another uh, critical scene in Tanakh where the protagonist is described as Levado, being alone, lending further credence to the reading here of Yaakov split in two. In the passage in Perak Bet of Bracious, Adam is also subdivided in order to be rejoined and become a whole greater than prior to his bifurcation. Before the creation of woman, Adam is seen as lacking wholeness. Lo tov hayot ha'adam levado. The similarity extends to a remarkable use of parallel language. In order for Adam to make way for Chava, God causes slumber to fall upon him and takes from one of his ribs. The word for rib being tzadi lamed ayin, tzela, which most often in Tanakh means aside. 
Tsela is also the root of solea, to limp. The process of Adam becoming whole is achieved at the cost of his Tsela, and the price that Yaakov pays for the bifurcation and wrestling with his self at Yabok, the injury that will ultimately make him whole in the sense of achieving integrity, is his limping away, solea, from the encounter. I thought that was a pretty neat piece of uh, literary analysis with Sela and Solea and Lovado and Lovado. Uh, he does have a note that uh, historically these two Tsadi Lamed Ayans actually come from two different root words, but uh, there's no reason that it can't still be a wordplay because by the time this would have been set down, they, that, chain, that shift in phonetics would have already taken place. All right. Um, he goes on for a while with some of that Freudian stuff that is referenced in the subtitle of the book that we don't need to get into necessarily. Um, okay, now he comes to the actual uh, episode. This being who has the power to bless Jacob functions in the story, at least on one level, as the mirror of Jacob's own repressed moral self-judgment. So that sentence is, is doing a lot of lifting, but he's going to unpack it. Um, simultaneously, the stranger functions as the divine image within Yaakov that bids him to become autonomous. So here's what we have. A man wrestles with Yaakov at Yabok. At daybreak, there's a stalemate, no victor, no progress, and here a painful injury is incurred. Yaakov, whose name means to, to catch someone on the heel, the sneak from behind, the trickster who's tricks Lavan, he is struck from behind and gets a sprain or dislocation or whatever on the back of the, of the thigh. Yaakov is the injured party, yet it, it is the each that begs for release, which is an apparent inconsistency in the logic of the story, unless one understands the struggle as an internal one. It is the attacking man or angel or whatever it is that tells Yaakov, send me away for the dawn is rising, even though they've had this stalemate and this entity has just scored an injurious uh, advantage over Yaakov. He then says, you got to let me go. Yaakov's other half begs for release before daylight and everything points to the relief of separation for both adversaries. But here the story and our hero surprise us. Though Yaakov has been injured, he is now the one who refuses to let go, and he tells us why. It's because of the blessing. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Yaakov has the chance to send away the repressed identity of Yaakov, the heel grabber, the taker of birthrights and blessings, the Yaakov who said, I'm Ace of your firstborn. He can send that away, but if he does so now, he will remain unentitled at the deepest levels of identity and moral integrity. In other words, Oh, actually, you know what? I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. He will be incapable of facing Asav the next morning if in this state. So at this moment is in time, he cannot circumvent any longer. He refuses the request for release of this adversary and in effect says, I will not let go. I will wrestle to the end for I must gain belated entitlement to the blessing. In this reading, when Yaakov tells this entity, whether it's himself as Rabbi Klitzner is reading, whether it's the ace of, it can work either way, the, this ace of spirit, he is demanding the blessing that he's already obtained. Rabbi Klitzner is saying he is demanding to become entitled to it. He already has it, but he realizes that he obtained it in an unethical way, and he is facing his own guilt his own moral repressed moral self judgment over having achieved uh, superiority over his brother uh, in this way. Excuse Yaakov me? has asked for yes. Go ahead. Um, I'm just thinking about what you said, and it just strikes me that there are three instances where Yaakov um, tries to get a bracha or a benefit. So he does that whole extortion thing with the soup in order to be the Bechor, right? He deceives his father and now he's forcing, wrestling um, an angel. In none of the, in all of them, there is an element of negativity while trying in the pursuit of a bracha. I mean, it just strikes me as so 
dissonant. So, so that dissonance in the first two episodes that you made reference to, and even going back to, as Rabbi Klitzner says, grabbing the heel, even that be, it being an example of a, being a, a, an attack, an attacker from behind. That's what I think is driving this interpretation here that he's making, saying that this grappling with himself is his self-realization, his irrepression of that moral self-judgment so that he can be worthy of this new name of this blessing okay. so the, and yeah so indeed that is it would it would just have to do with taking this episode and somehow seeing it as separate from those other episodes and the way that it ensues and he he uh it seems to get out with what he wants even though he limps away from it uh would would suggest that i think that uh there is some sort of difference between this one and the other ones it's, it has to do with, with the, the general maturation of the character of Jacob from being this, he starts as like almost a trickster uh, folklore paradigm. And by the end of the story, he's this incredibly, incredibly old person standing in front of the Pharaoh of Egypt. And Pharaoh is asking him for a blessing. Um, and Yaakov blesses him and leaves. And uh, like, th this is this is an, an incredibly important step in that maturation, yeah. Is it possible that he is um, injured because that when you mess with these things, it exacts a price on you? Sure. I mean, it, it, it is unusual that it says there was a stalemate all the way until the morning. And when the, you know, this angel or whatever it is has to suddenly go before daybreak for whatever esoteric reason, suddenly it manages to score a, dis a hip dislocation on it. It was like, maybe the stalemate wasn't quite a stalemate. You know what I mean? There's there's something not clear about exactly what it means that the angel could not overcome Yaakov or this entity could not overcome Yaakov, but was capable of injuring Yaakov. Right. Um, so I think that what you're saying makes sense. You can you can walk you can walk away alive, but you can't walk away unscathed. That is, if this is an angelic encounter. Within the interpretation of Rabbi Klitzner, it would be something more like um he he grappled with himself until he, until he ultimately was forced to um, cut himself to the core to to face himself and to be realize. injured by that self realization. Yeah. Um, Yaakov has asked for a blessing, and we, together with this mysterious figure who who mirrors Yaakov's inner demons. Lead Yaakov was, can hardly refrain from remarking a blessing. Very interesting choice of words. So Rebecca, he's having fun with the same idea that you brought up. The, 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 this character, this Ish, then leads Yaakov back to the scene where, in order to receive the blessing, Yaakov was first asked by Yitzchak, who are you, my son? The mirror slash adversary slash Ish, however we're translating it, knows to return, to return precisely to this moment when he asks Yaakov the one deceptively simple but existentially pivotal question, what is your name? This time, in order to receive the, the blessing, Yaakov must again answer the same question that blind Yitzchak had asked decades earlier. Who are you? What is your name? This time, Yaakov utters the words, I am Yaakov. Immediately, the adversary turned therapist, the one capable of bestowing blessings and restoring wholeness, this is a driving theme in this uh, chapter that I'm skipping around a little bit. He responds by saying, your name shall no longer be called Yaakov, but rather Yisrael, for you have struggled or confronted uh, with the divine and the human. Only when fully acknowledging and internalizing one's past can one's identity evolve or proceed to the next stage of development. Yaakov cannot become Yisrael until he can say, I am Yaakov. This is the relationship between verses 28 and 29, going back in order to go forward. The scene where this entity, this Ish, changes the name Yaakov to Yisrael is confirmed in Perak uh, Lamed Hay, where God himself appears to Yaakov uh, when he finally returns to Beit El and fulfills this vow that he had made all those years before. And God blesses Yaakov and says to him, your name is Yaakov. You shall no longer be called Yaakov, but rather Yisrael shall be your name. And he called his name Yisrael. The odd but clearly purposeful repetition at the beginning of this verse, first saying, your name is Jacob, before continuing to say, you shall no longer be called Jacob, highlights the need for owning one's own past in order to move 
towards the future. Um, so you have a Yaakov from this point on who Rabbi Klitzner starts to analyze as acting either Jacob Lee or Yisrael Lee from this point onward. Um, Yaakov continues to be called Yaakov as well as Yisrael even after the name change in Perek Lamed Hay. In subsequent episodes in Yaakov's life, he does seem to behave what we would call Jacob Lee. The understanding of the change of the name as an evolving identity doesn't discard the previous name or identity. Um, this idea may be subtly indicated in an earlier verse that has always been troubling, he says, Rabbi Klitzner says, because of its unusual content and phrasing. After Yaakov awakens from the dream of the ladder with the uh, angels going up and down to and from the heavens, and just before he utters his vow at Beit El, he names the place of his epiphany Beit El, house of God, but a very odd parenthetic postscript is then tacked to the end of that verse. It says, he called the name of that place Beit El. However, Luz was the name of the city previously. So what is the significance of the rather terse text supplying us with rare historical, geographical nomenclature information and providing it after the new naming, as if to emphasize that the name wasn't always what it has become now, and there is importance in preserving the old name. This significance may lie in the effect of foreshadowing that the renamed location of Luz Beit El will be the site of Yaakov's own renaming in Perak Lamed Hay upon his return from Lavam's house. In that renaming as well, the prior name and identity will not only be preserved, but will be reaffirmed as indispensable for the further evolution of identity. So in a sense, what we end up with is neither a Yaakov nor a Yisrael, but a Yaakov Yisrael, that there's some sort of, in facing his other half, he has performed a synthesis. He has uh, successfully integrated in a coherent way sides of his personality that he wasn't allowing to face themselves previously. The side that would be confident and brash and trickstery and, you know, I don't want to make a pun, but fleece Lavan out of a whole bunch of, of uh, valuables uh, when it came to the sheep, that whole thing. Um, but also who is scared in the face of his brother, who he, uh, the la last time he saw him, he knew that his brother was coming to kill him. So he seems to have these, uh, this, this confidence, this cockiness, as well as this uh, nervousness, if not fright. It, um, and when it comes to at least Rabbi Klitzner's reading of the episode, it's facing that darker side or that less, um, it's it's facing the side of himself that was not going about things in a, in a way that was the way of integrity. Uh, that is what that episode at the riverbank at Yabok accomplishes, right? The, the, the point of the episode is that Yaakov is able to take this step and move himself without stopping being who he already was into this persona of Yisrael, this, this more seasoned, weathered uh, individual who's been through it, who has um, contended with uh, not it says with divinities and with humans, but it doesn't specify. These humans were his own family. It's his uh, his father for whom he wasn't the favorite. It's his brother who wanted to kill him. It's his uncle who uh, tried to deceive him over the course of like two decades. It was it was all drawn out. He was stuck there just taking it. He has been through right, been through it with humans, and now he has actually face that side of himself that is attached to the divine. And so he can integrate and synthesize those things. So you lose something when you leave behind that Midrash, that this represents an angel of Hashem being sent, that there's some divinity driving this uh, episode, that there's something that Yaakov is facing that's external. And you lose the possibility, all the fun discussion of, what, is it coming from God or is this 
um, the midrash that the uh, Ish here is the patron spirit or patron demon of Asav. Um, all of that fun stuff sort of goes away when you try to make this into a psychoanalytical reading. Um, but it also underlines some of the things going on in the text, like uh, the wordplay that I think uh, are certainly there. And there's a reason that they're there. And um, I won't say that I think that uh, the entire, again, it's the book is called Wrestling Jacob. I won't say that the uh, entire book, um, that the the overall network of um, readings that Rabbi Klitzner is making throughout the book, I won't say I necessarily endorse all of them, but in this section of Vayishlach, which he spends a lot of time on relative to the whole story of Yaakov, um, you know, it's only, it's only a very short, portion of the text then it's an incredibly short pe period of time but this episode leading up to what happens with ace of is very formative um and that's there's a reason that there that the name change to israel is in this context at this moment in the story and whether so whether you think that he's facing himself or whether you think that he's facing if you think about it the patron saint, patron demon, patron spirit of Esau would also be the same as Yaakov's own no longer repressed moral self-judgment saying, hey, you stole from me, right? You 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 operated in bad faith with me and got in between me and my father, right? So whether it's uh, Yaakov's own memory of that misbehavior or whether it's the, the spirit representing Esau making this accusation and them locking in a stalemate or whether it's something coming from you know, divinely, as we saw, possibly to injure Yaakov, to punish him for being afraid, possibly to injure him, as we saw in the Radak, um, suggesting that perhaps it would be um, an indication that he injured his thigh, as telling him something about his daughter would be sexually assaulted, which is a strange reading. Um, but again, those two are looking for a reason why he would have been promised uh, to be free from harm and then he came to be harmed um with these uh with these interpretations of what's going on with the uh episode overall i think that we can see that like this is one of the underrated turning points in safer bracious there's a lot of um big moments uh, and set pieces that we tend to think of uh the brisbane avasarim or or the akeda or the um, even the scene with uh, with Rachel hiding the idols from Lavan is a more dramatic scene than this. It's drawn out. You get stage direction. There's like you can you could make you could reliably put on a play of that. This one, there's so many questions. How do you depict the Ish? Who's the Ish? Is there two people on stage or one person on stage? If it's Rabbi Klitzner, there's one person on stage, right? It's Yaakov himself. So there's. Um, there's there's a very uh, a deep turning point in Bracious that I think is hidden in uh, in this very relatively short space in uh, this week's parsha. I um, Rabbi Silber has always said that aside from the text which just says Kisarita imelokibatuchal that it was a struggle that Yisrael means Yashar that he goes from being crooked to being straight. I like that. That's a pretty good visual. Even if even if it's not the the intent of the text at all, it certainly is is like it's certainly there as as a, a, an undertone. Because yeah, when you would have written this out uh, in ancient times, there would be no dots. It would look exactly the same as Yashar. I like that a lot. And and Yisrael is also called at some points Yishurun. So. It's related. Yeah, they're used. They're used in parallelism. They're used in parallelism with one another as a as a word pair you know, throughout Tanakh. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. All right. Sorry, sorry. Can you unmute again? I thought you were done. I apologize. Okay. There's uh, there's one um, I footnote in Rabbi Klitzner's um, one of the chapters on this struggle that I absolutely love. It has nothing to do with what you were talking about, but it it's. Um, uh, folk, it was pointed out to him by a student that because the Torah wasn't written and it was all oral, people remembered verses and remembered episodes by what they heard, by what um, oral, A-U-R-A-L connections they could make. And the um, Hagida na Shemecha is related to the Gid ha na I, I just yeah. thought that was a great little There's... like pun, but... 
yeah, there's two of them. There's there's um uh what was it? It's oh gosh. Now I have to look back. I already pulled out the uh the or it was Vaiva Ter that because the Vav and the Vet would have been heard the same way, people would have been put in mind of the Brit Bain Habitarim, where Abraham Vayivater et the animals. So the, uh, the, the that uh, I like both of those. I like those kinds of things. I'm not sure, again, I, I, I'm always uh, a, a little bit nervous about saying, oh yeah, that's Pshat, but like, yeah, that makes so much sense that you really, really want it to be definitely a fact rather than just a cool idea. So I like that kind of stuff. And Hagida Nashimecha is uh, definitely underscored by the fact that it says Gita Nashe in exactly that way, exactly that phrasing twice right afterwards. Um, yes, that's an excellent footnote. Thank you for including that on the stream. Um, if I may, my favorite from, from his uh, insights is... Um, Yaakov says to his mother, Ulai Musheni Avi. And in biblical Hebrew, there are two ways of saying maybe. There's Ulai and there's pen. Ulai is a possibility, maybe, but with a positive connotation. And pen, we would translate into English not as maybe, but as lest. Okay? So when he says, we might have thought, expected him to say, lest my father touch me. You know, if he touches me, he'll, the jig is up. He knows what's happening. And I don't want that to happen. But when Yaakov uses the word, it gives us some insight into his mindset at the time, which was, I hope my father detects what's happening and then this is all over. I cannot deny my mother. I cannot not listen to her. But I hope that I get out of this mess by my father going, wait a minute. And some of that actually did happen. Um, but I love the difference between Ulai and Pen. I thought that was such a sharp uh, reading of it. I love it. I love it. Absolutely. I think that's like... Uh... The biggest compliment I can give is I think that's actually shot. I think that's like straight up exactly how I would all what you say about how we would render it into English is the perfect way to explain it because lest is is a very useful word in English to imply maybe this could happen and that would be terrible. Uh, um, there's like a hopeful perhaps and there's maybe also a neutral maybe uh, and the the sensitivity to using Ulai versus pen is is uh, is is a good touch. Okay. Any any other questions or comments? Justin? No? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just do this. I'll unmute everyone. So yeah. Okay. Everyone can hear me. Thank you so much, Michael. This was so interesting. And thank you to all the participants who were uh, part of our learning community today and always. Uh, I really enjoyed this class. Um, we have a couple more uh, classes uh, that are starting uh, soon, and it's not too late to sign up for them. Um, Hanukkah, uh, well, yeah, Hanukkah holiday just of started, uh, yeah. home buddies. Oh, sorry, go ahead. They just started. It was yesterday and the day before. So they the recordings just started. Were on okay, sounds good. It looks like the notes that I have here might be wrong. So I will just end the class with saying that I really, 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 really enjoyed uh, being together with everyone and learning. And I can't wait to see you in the next class. Okay. Lehitraot. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.